Oh no, you know, with Run, the, run. Join in, join the army, then join the police. Oh right, what happened in the army? The reason, one of the reasons why I do this, I was, I was saying to Baz about a fatal crash that I caused when I was in the police, is one of the things. Yeah, I think we spoke about it briefly yeah. on the phone, didn't we? Right. Yeah. So, like I said, we, this is recording now. We're yeah. live, mate. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, let's crack the beers. <laughs> Ash Bryce, absolute pleasure to finally make it happen. Which one of these do you want? I do. I like that one. Yeah, first you have that one. I like the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute pleasure to have you, mate. Um, I had actually forgot you ex-military. Yeah, I'd forgotten because because I was in the RMP. It doesn't really count. Ah, oh, <laughs> well, you said it. There we go. That's why. Right. <laughs> no, I think it's because. Cheers. Cheers. I think it's because. Um... Mm. Nice. I think it's because you what you do now yeah. is semi new and unknown to me and that and so that took me the the is is what's has stuck in my mind to a conversation before um ash bryce what do you do uh i'm a inspector in david paris police that's mid wales the vast majority of wales really uh so from uh just north of aberystwyth yeah all the way down so all the way down to tenby and across uh past Lethley. So a big part of Wales. Uh, but I'm an inspector in Ceredigion, so I work out of Aberystwyth. Uh, and my job, I, I look after the custody suites, but also look after what's, you know, stuff out on the ground, front line, uh, with the response crews, really. There's a few inspectors, and we just cover for each other. So if I'm working, there's no other inspector working, I'll cover their job. So, What about the negotiation side of things? Yeah, I'm one of a small team. Uh, I got into hostage and crisis negotiation probably about six years ago. So five, five or six years ago, went up to Scotland, did the national course up there, and then joined a very small cadre in David Powers Police. Um, and what we do is we respond. We're all volunteers, and for our force, it's sergeants and above um, only. And we, we're we trying to work out why, because your rank doesn't make you a better communicator. So... What we do is we go on an on-call system uh, and we get an awful lot of calls for people in crisis. So the, somebody phones the ops room or there's been an incident and officers on the front line will call for a negotiator. So someone in a domestic barricade, someone on the edge of a bridge, someone with a knife to their throat, someone armed with a gun. So we get involved in all sorts of operations. Uh, and they're quite dynamic. We've got pre-planned operations uh, where we know what's going on, but the majority of the calls are, this is happening, can you deploy? So we go out with, unlike businesses, when we do our negotiations, we've got nothing to offer. We go out and we we deal with things as we see them, do as much research as we can. We've got people that work with us that do all the intelligence research as we're, we're arriving at scenes. And we've got a team that we can rely on, you know, to give us the best information, to give us... Uh, a good chance of getting a safe resolution to an incident. How much did your ass twitch when, uh, when you get one of those calls? <laughs> it's weird, that, you know. It's a fantastically rewarding part of the job. It's it's an amazing thing to do to to think that because you, you you train for it. It's a very very intense course. Sorry, it's a it's a really intense course, um, and it's got quite a high failure rate as well because the pressure is on. Uh, it's, it's mental pressure and psychological, really, when you're doing the course. But when you're out uh, and you're on call and the call comes in, job on, can you go? Sometimes you'll be at home uh, and you'll have to look at the message come in, work out the best method, then brief a command team and then deploy. Or you can then ask for another negotiator to assist. To assist. And we're coordinated as well. So we've got people that I'm one of the coordinators and we'll look at the best people to use, who's available, where they are, how quick can we get to the incident. And then it is quite a nerve-wracking thing because they're all different. And you can't say, I've done one like this before because the people are different, the location's different, the timing's different, the officers there are different. And it's relying on your experience, training, and I think a lot of it, not luck, but you know, when you just you do a bit of thin slicing of somebody in a situation, they think... My gut instinct says this, but we've got an awful lot to fall back on about how we make decisions, what we're basing that on, 
So a lot of it's research based as well. We've got a really good database of previous incidents, how they were resolved, and we can look at the statistics of the the best methods. But most of it is just about listening to people, because a lot of people in crisis are, are they're not being listened to at all, and they're used to people speaking at them constantly. And most of our stuff is all this active listening. It's just doing that really well. That so that combined with the, the you mentioned the experience and then the, the mental the mental pressure of dealing with a situation like that. With I mean, what you mentioned earlier about you need to be a sergeant above. When you said that, I thought, well, that would be because of experience and uh, experience and um, experience in on the job. Yeah, uh, and obviously not being negotiator and uh, and m- mental resilience in the job, which yeah. I would suggest that the more senior at the ranks you get, as long as provided you've been through all the lower ranks and yeah. you've got that. But <clears throat> so you get a call. Yeah. And then you you first oh, so off the bat you need to brief the guys on the ground in okay, these these this is what you should be doing until I get there. Yeah, yeah. Um but the good thing is now we've realised that there's a there's a problem. Uh in that a lot of people aren't confident in, in doing that because they'll say, oh, you know, if if the training isn't good enough, so what I'm doing at the moment I've rolled out a training package in our force. So I'm delivering the training of first response to crisis. Uh, so I've, you know we've got a training package and we're looking at getting it accredited with the College of Police in and then rolling that out and I'm looking at getting an, an enhanced communications course where I'll be running it with other people and we've got some outside speakers keen to come in to basically make our staff on the front line so that includes, includes the call handlers that take initial calls uh, all levels of command so bronze, silver and gold commanders so inspectors, chief inspectors, superintendents uh, then you've got officers on the ground, PCSOs, anybody. Because until we turn up, you're a negotiator whether you like it or not. So, you know, an, an awful lot of our incidents are resolved by the first people there. So it's just giving them that confidence and ability to think, I've had that input, I've had that training. And they're in the job and we we all communicate in the job. I know a lot of police aren't that popular. You know, there's a, a big perception of police are this, that and the other. But most people that I've worked with are there actually to help people. And they're trying to do it to the be- as best they can. If we can give them a bit of a assistance, you know, and, and help them out, then that's what we're trying to do. Is It's trying to stop that situation where someone says, I don't know what to do, and someone then jumps. What's the most common crisis you get called to? Uh, most, most things are, it's just it's suicide intervention, suicide prevention. Um, obviously we get some crimes in action we get um, different things we get kidnaps Uh, there's you know there's all different ways of doing it but the most popular well it's most popular most common sorry (laughs) not popular that sounds wrong the most common call we get is um, suicide intervention and it's crisis management really yeah I'm still laughing at (laughs) (laughs) most popular (laughs) it's that's that sounds a bit shouldn't wrong. Shouldn't laugh, shouldn't yeah. laugh. And it's, you know, and uh, well, it's, it's that, that's that dark human coming out. Yeah. It's like, uh, um, and the, and that suicide thing is how we end up talking. Yeah. Um, because you were looking at, right, correct. You, you were interested in doing some research around veterans, correct? Yes. Ex- yeah. Expand on that then, please. Uh, I served for just under 10, 10 years in the, in the army. RMP. Um, so I, I joined up in 1990, went to Bovington at Junior Leaders, did a year there, then went through our depot, then went through, served in various places. And unfortunately, as I think most of us have who've been in the military, have lost a few friends and colleagues through suicide. And you don't realise it affects you because we unlike, we deployed as a core. So as a, as a core, you, you move around individually. So there's a company location here, there and everywhere. And individuals get posted to and from, so you get to meet people from different different areas where you'd never meet them before. You know, like in regiments, you move as a whole, don't you? We moved individually, and you know, it's the unfortunate thing of you catch up with some people and say, "Oh, how's what?" You know, and you name someone, they go, oh, did, you, "Did you not hear?" And you, it starts affecting you a bit. You you you've, see, the more conflicts there are, the more people you hear of, um, unfortunately, taking their own life. Then when I joined the police, I didn't realise how many people were do, you know were in crisis, and then um, it was just 
when I got to doing the negotiating, I I was looking at the statistics and looking at it and thinking, hold on, there's quite a lot of veterans who are doing this because the crisis uh, that they're facing now is completely different. Anyway, you know, I left the army in 2000, so I'd, I'd worked in Northern Ireland and, and Kosovo, whereas just after I left, you know, the second Gulf, then Afghanistan, Sierra Leone, you know, there's a different kind and people were deployed real quick for intense thing. You know, it's war fighting, gunfights, you know, it's all sorts of contacts going on, which must affect people differently. And then you come back here and you see what people are going through. And I, I can't say I understand what you're going through because I don't. I've never been there. But I've got a comprehension of it. And what I'm trying to do is trying to help people that when you realise about the <coughs> veterans uh, who are suffering and you see all the charities and, you, and you, it's all over social media, it's on the news, you think, well, I'm in a position where I have to deal with people who are on the edge and I've got probably six to 30 seconds to get my foot in the door try and make a positive impression and then work on that and then use some experience to try and build some rapport, get a bit of trust and get them to change their behaviour and their way of thinking. Why six to 30 seconds? Um, it's... What's that based on? You know, their perception, you know, your gut instinct. There's lots and lots of studies. Um, <clears throat> and I remember there's a professor I'm working with in, in UCL. I've, I've been speaking with her quite a lot and she did a, a snapshot of some uh, classical pianists or concert pianists going for their auditions. They're all playing the same piece of music. They're dressed the same. They're playing the same piano. It's the same camera angle, but there's no sound. And you just see, I think it's a six-second clip of each one, and say, with the clicker, vote who you think gets it, gets the job. And yeah. the massive majority got it right, just based on the perception <coughs> who had the most passion, who, how they looked, the energy. So by speaking to her and working closely with her, we're, we're looking at working closely in the future, we're trying to change the way that police officers turn up and have that, being armed with that information of try and, you know, humanise yourself. Because a, a lot of people turn into robotic when they don't know what to do. They're just, you know, I'm concerned, this, that. And they speak a lot, an awful lot of jargon. And we're just trying to get people to Rapport. just chill out. And yes, it's a high a high pressure environment, but be a human. Don't talk like a robot. Just like I always take my watch off. Always take my watch off because I've got a habit of looking at my watch. And if you say <laughs> you're the most important thing to me, and I keep checking my watch. Most people, because they're, they're hypersensitive, will say, well, it can't be because you keep looking at your watch. You've got somewhere to go. So I re overtly remove my watch. I'll turn my radio off. I'll take body armor off and just get rid of the barriers and just sit down and just try and chat. And I think a lot of it is that just a lot of people in crisis, not saying this is all, but a, a lot of people just want to be listened to and they want someone to genuinely listen and care. So that's what we're trying to do is just sit down and listen to people. And it's amazing how it, how it does work. Mm. Uh, I I'm I'm reading uh, Tribe by Sebastian Younger at the minute. Have you have you heard that book? Uh no I haven't too. Oh, so. Good friend Mike gave it to me. Um and I've been so I've been telling him to read it for ages. I won't I won't batter on about it, but the point I'm gonna bring up this is that in <clears throat> in the book it's about uh, it's about um it's about how modern society uh I'm only halfway through, but it's about how how the modern society, modern technology has 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 destroyed our true value in life <clears throat> and how um like the, the the reasons for high depression, high suicide rates, uh, one of the main reasons for high depression, high suicide rates, high mental illness, um, why it's all higher in developed countries as yeah. opposed to not is because we're increasingly detached from ourselves, detached from our brothers and sisters and, and yeah. family and detached from society and community. And we don't find it hard to feel valued, find it hard to have purpose. And, uh, and, and that comes back to your bit there about we just want to be listened to be be a, a valuable a valuable part of the community but a lot of the time i mean you know when you get to the point of being suicidal i'd argue that every single person who gets to the point of being suicidal yeah. is mentally ill even yeah. in hideous moments where they have just had a, a, their loved one killed in front yeah. of them and they got nothing nothing yeah. else to live for you know um 
it must be to turn up to a situation like that as a police officer that that is com- a completely different kind of pressure to turning up to a kinetic incident with a shooting yeah. or a kinetic incident with a, a robbery going on yeah. or a, a, a violence happening because you deal with that with physical yeah. it's a physical response to deal with what you're talking about with that negotiation that's you got to try you got to get the report like you said the rapport with that person yeah. that is hideously nerve-wracking yeah. hideously nerve-wracking because it involve it must involve a whole level of, of emotion in that from a police officer's, officer's perspective yeah. than you would before and, that, and then to remain calm in that situation unless you've been experienced in it before must be hideous yeah and that's what we're trying to do with the training because negotiators aren't the first ones there you know it's the call handler if you think the call handler in a situation like you said there where their partner's just been killed in front of them is that person going to be the one that phones, phones the police you've got that call handler trying to deal with that and get some information to deploy police officers to the scene but the first officers on the scene or the first members of the public on the scene it's just that what do you do and you know that's what we're doing the training for but the when you do turn up at incidents like that it's you try and fall back on on training and remain calm but when I, when we turn up it's I was, I was saying to Baz earlier where we turn up and it's like whew, you know, because they say, oh, says negotiator, you can deal with this. But if if the officer on the scene has got the rapport, then we'll stay as advisors because there's no point, you know, us saying, yeah, we'll deal with this. If they're doing a really good job, which most of them are, you'll just say, well, I'll just, if you need some help, I'm here. But just, we can just feed them some, some information because if you start getting that rapport and that little bit of trust with that person, then you say, stop, this person that you don't know is now taking over. You have to reset and start again. And that person that you were dealing with will say, well, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to that person. I like them. So we you know, we, we act as advisors a lot as well, whether it's on the phone, on the radio, because the area where we work, obviously the deployment times can be considerable because it's a huge force area. So a lot of the times we'll, we'll pass advice on over the radio uh, and, and just speak to the officers or the, per- the person that's backing them up. And that's what we're trying to do with the training. But when you do turn up at an incident like that, it is your mind is racing. You're trying to think, what do I do? What do I, you know? And then you just think you've got, you've got to just breathe, take a breath, because everyone's looking at you, thinking you're in uniform. This is your job. You sort it out. And it's just like, Oof. and if you say, I don't, I don't know, it's that we're, we're in the privileged position to make make decisions. And if we can train people to make the right decisions, then that can only be a good thing. So I don't, you know, we, that's what we're trying to do. But again, you know, I remember my first call out and I was absolutely bricking it. What was it? What was it the was call just out? Uh, again, it, it was a suicide intervention, and it was it was over the phone. You know, I sent sent a text. Text came. You know, it just said delivered. And then it was constant a text. Then I was phoning. Then I was phoning. The, it was just, the guys in the ground. No, no, this was. Uh, the it was just that they were saying it was a high risk missing person, oh. suicidal. Can you make contact? So we didn't know where they were, and it was just. And you text them. Yeah, it was. A, oh. it, we got we got a phone number, and it was just text, text, nothing. Then, ring, ring, and then you know you're just waiting, and you don't want to be persistent. You know you, you need to keep up that. I'm going to keep trying. I'm really worried about you. Uh, we're we're looking. Can you talk? I, I just want to help. I'd like to understand. Because we've got to be careful about the wording. I want, I need to. If you're in crisis, you're like, hold on. Everyone gives me orders. You're giving me orders. You want me to talk to you. you you're you in the police. You know, so you've got to try and word it in a way. So all of, all of your texts, you've actually got to think about how you word it and how it's going to be perceived. So we do that. You know, my, I remember my first call, and it was just uh, not really no even though you had the train and this is the real thing and i was by myself so you, you're there and you, you get the, all the intelligence that we can about the person and you spoke to their you know family b- beforehand uh to try and get something to to do and then what we do is you, once the call was, was made it was just silence and you're just talking to an open line but you can hear them breathing and oh. you know and it's just keep talking but in that you know uh, i'd say <laughs> Uh, Friday night DJ voice is the most successful. Do it, yeah. do it now. <laughs> do it now. <laughs> that sounds do wrong. Yeah, you no. can. You can ring me. You can call me. I'm suicidal. What's, oh, what's your voice? No, no. 
<laughs> do it. <laughs> no, no. But you know, it's you've got to be because you've got to be non-judgmental completely, and you've got to have the right pace, pitch, and tone to deal with people. Um, but you can't be so calm that there's no urgency or emotion in it. So you've got to you've got to check and test yourself all the time, but on and gauge against the reaction that you get from people. So you, you're constantly adapting. I've got the most boring voice in the world. I've got, a, you know, a monotone, boring voice, and I, guess, I know I it. I guess it's wonderful. <laughs> but <laughs> call me after. No, it's but when you're you're dealing with it, you know, some people react really well, and you think, oh, this is because they'll say, "Are you in the police?" Because you know, I, well, I work. Yeah, you know, I work with the police, <laughs> and you just talk. Because if you say, "I am," this is my rank. This is what I do. It can go against everything you're trying to achieve. So it is just that. Forget my rank. Forget my role. Just I'm here to chat. And you do them. They do the majority of the talking if they want. But if not, it's just trying to guide them through to show the support. And it's it's nice when you start getting the um, the conversational returns. You know, if it's all silence and then suddenly you'll get a uh huh. You think oh, so. In the training that we we do, you know, you think of conversations like a tennis match, isn't it? In that, my turn, your turn, my turn, your turn. That's the no, the normal way of conversation. But when you're talking to an open line, it's like my turn, my turn, <laughs> my turn. You think, oh, but a lot of the time, you know, just that consistency and showing that that you actually mean it. You know, the empathy, not sympathy. You know, knowing the difference between the two and then just saying, you're getting that return back and you think, oh, this is where the tennis starts. You know, the it's back and forward, back and forward. And some people might slam the ball back at you and you've just got to slow the pace down and tap it back. And it moves all around. It's a bit of a weird analogy to use. But if you think of the lines on a court of the different topics, <clears throat> then that's where the ball will go. It goes, and then you start controlling it where you want it to go. So we've got a conversation with a purpose. In the startup, it's all about them. Everything's about them. Listening and just taking your turn in the conversation. And then a lot of the time, reflection's quite a good one. You know where if someone's talking and then you pick up a power word in what they've said or use the last two or three uh, words in their sentence. Can we explain what you mean? Where, say, if someone was talking and they're, they're, they're angry... And they said, you know, it's like, like with my mum, your mum. And then that they go straight back on, they start talking about their mum and you would listen out last two or three words. And they'll say, oh, yeah, no, because of my dog, your dog. <laughs> and they just, yeah, you know, sense, and it yeah. just, yeah. Yeah. because that's the confirmation that you're listening. And because you've used their own words or a term they've used, it's, you know, it, it encourages conversation. And then that's when you see, and again, by using the Friday night DJ voice for the most of the time, you keep it level. So if someone's, uh, you know, volume increases and they get agitated, you've just got to try and control it because I think a lot of people in arguments, we don't want, to, want it to be an argument on the phone. It's if they argue and they're up here, if you try and shout louder, they shout louder, you know, and it's that like Batari's box, if you've ever heard of that. You know, with your no. your behaviour affects my behaviour. You know, and it's where people just start screaming and shouting. But if you are, this is the way I always try and work it, is if someone's really agitated and you're nice, polite, calm, but can raise it as and when you need to, it's very hard to be angry with someone who's polite <laughs> constantly. Because it, it, you let people vent, and then they'll gradually come down, or you bring them down with you. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just that, and it all takes time. Negotiation takes an awful lot of time. It's not the, <clears throat> hello, I'm in the police. I, you know, can you come down? Yes, good. You know, that's not how it works. It takes a long time, a lot, of, because you've got to the introductions. You know who you are, and you've got to work out how to do that. The perception that we talked about. How do you make your approach? Because Percentage-wise, only 7% of how we communicate is actually what you say. So if you think of all the other stuff is, you know, how you look, how you present, how you come across, 
and that's what we're trying to concentrate on. It's that initial impression of that six second. What can you do in that six to 30 seconds that makes you look the part and look caring and look different from the others? Mm -hmm. So it's not an us and them thing with it with with other officers, but there is a, a way of trying to make yourself look or sound different from the norm. So they'll say, oh, I, you know, a lot of people will say in, in jobs, they'll say, well, I like you, you're different from them. And we're not. We've just basically sh shown a different side of policing because, you know, you've got armed officers are doing a, their thing and they look very aggressive and intimidating. And then if you look out and there's one person wearing a different colour jacket who's talking to you calmly, then that's the, that's the way to do that. You know, it's look at me, don't look at them. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it's just a knack. I think you just pick it up. So where does the interest in the veterans come from in fact what was the, who's the late what does the lady at kcl do what, what does she do the what the lady at kcl you talked about kcl you talked about the pianist studies oh ucl 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 kcl, KCL. KCL. UCL. <laughs> sorry ucl uh she's she is a profession she's um uh an academic obviously studying and teaching about perception but she does negotiation as well so corporate negotiation is different to police uh, because with corporate things, you've obviously you can go in there. You've got a script. You know what people want. So business negotiations are: you can plan, you can look at what you're going to do. Um, and obviously, we, we can do that. We've got ways of doing things and, and methods. Mm -hmm. But when we go in, effectively, as a, as a friend of mine said, we we negotiate with nothing to offer most of the time. You turn up at a bridge. What what have you got to offer? And it, it's that, how can you convince that person not to go? And it's, you've got to think, you've got to make everything seem appealing. You know, you've got to just think, right, you need passion, you need empathy, you need that, the human touch, you know, you really, really need to engage and forget if you've got any baggage, just get rid of it. You just need to focus on that and, and what we're trying to say is, is to people just think that's your relative on that on there what would you really say or do if it was a friend or relative on the bridge would you speak in police jargon or would you actually be a person and a lot of people pick it up you know because everyone's uh changing you know it's different generations of people different communication methods like you said where there's people are there's different resilience levels the, the way they deal with the world is different isn't it so um, well, it's <laughs> it's an interesting job, and I think it's probably the most rewarding job you can do in the police, in my in my view. Mm. To you know, if you if you're on your deathbed and and somebody says, "What did you achieve in your life?" and you say, "I saved a life," job done. You know, you think that's a pretty good thing. But in in our position, we, we get the opportunity um, and the the chance to to save as many as we can, and it is something that you know we're all volunteers and we do it and i it's challenging and but you've got to try and disengage as well because i think people keep asking you know do you take everybody's baggage home with you do you, you know how do you sleep at night and you've got to disengage really you know you think about things but you've got to deal with them if you turn up at an incident you haven't put that person in that position you're just doing that to do your very best to help them and that's the positive thing isn't it we you've gone there to help and unfortunately a lot of a lot of incidents end badly and you've just got to think you know how how did that happen and you know and there's, there's obviously investigations afterwards as what was said and done um but we are just there to help and that's primarily everyone's reason for doing the negotiation and for me with the veterans i think it's uh you know i've had a few friends and obviously in the police a few uh, colleagues I've known who've taken their own life. So for me, when I was I was thinking, right, there's an increase in, in veteran suicides. So what can I do about it to try and focus on that? So I've worked with, uh, I made contact with Woody's Lodge down in Barry in South Wales. Oh, you mentioned that to me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and they obviously, they deal with lots of veterans. You've got, you've got issues, all these groups, it's support groups, they use crafts, everything. It's a fantastic place down in, in Barry. I've been to see uh, uh, David Trotman there. I spoke to him earlier today as well. And David he's Trotman. He's a, he's a doctor 
and he's one of the, f- the founders of um, Woody's Lodge. And basically, it's a it's a retreat down there, and a, so it's a safe place for people to go. And veterans turn up. Um, it's a, it's a fantastic. I wouldn't I wouldn't profess to be an expert on what they do and every all of their structure, but I went down there to speak to David, and it's a fascinating place. And he's so emotionally involved in helping veterans. How does how does that place work then? Um, it's a. I think you can be referred there, but you can turn up. I think it's like a drop in centre as well. But it's for support, and I think a lot of the things they do is they've it's through word of mouth, and people go there. And it's they've got different things on different days, different activities, and it's giving people so they do the craft. I think there's a farm down there, and he's looking at some other promise, uh, premises as well, where it's a complete getaway. So if people are feeling feeling stressed, um, then they can they can go to to somewhere for help. And there's obviously a lot of organisations around the UK that do that. Uh, and I've I've been down to Woody's and and spoken to them and. What I was hoping to do, because this is where the project that I'm I'm looking at doing is started, really, was to help, because uh, because the high veteran suicide rates or attempted suicides or people who are in crisis. What I'm trying to do is trying to identify a group of veterans, um, however large or small, anyone that would be willing to participate, and it's fully confidential, is so that I can do a semi-structured interview with people who have been suicidal. So if they've been on the very, very edge, so if you use the example of a bridge, someone who's about to jump because for whatever reason, what was it that someone said or did that made them come back? And if we can find out that, it's obviously going to be different for everybody, but if we can find those things, that that might help with the police training or public training because... If it worked for one person, it could work for someone else. And then if we can uh, give our officers and staff more information about the actual prevention of, not the the lead up to it, that's obviously we can assist in doing that. But for for the the majority of this project, or the, the initial aim was to find out exactly what it was that someone said or did that could turn people back and offer them the support, so we've got to be quite careful about who we speak to and what level of care they've got with them at the moment because regressive, you know, an interview that would take somebody completely back could have a detrimental effect and we've got to be uh, careful that we don't just ask these questions, bring everything back and then just go, thank you, bye. And then they're left there with these these traumatic memories and they they go in, into crisis again because of what we've asked them. So we're trying to work out the the best way of making sure that everyone's got a level of care after contact with us. Um, and it's it's just me working on it at the moment with uh, David and I've got some academics that are interested. But it's just trying to spread the word that we're trying to do this because it works in our force area and if it works for the police here, it'll work for the public anywhere. It'll work for any organisation anywhere at in the world effectively if you can find out what makes people turn back then just that little bit of information might help save another life and that's where it all started it was a simple question and then it's just snowballing now from uh, a number of academics interested in what we're doing uh, and then just trying to get more people uh, from charities or anybody that's on a uh, got a helpline really that can help us uh, so if there's willing ve- veterans who would like to speak, then it's all confidential and there's a series of questions uh, and then we'll try and analyse what's happened, you know, about the what it was to then feed it back to make it some that people aren't alone. And But obviously with these questions, there'll be other information about the lead up to it and what what caused, not the the trauma itself, you know, the incident, the lack of support or contact leading up to their their sort of their current mental health crisis it might be very different for veterans you know yeah yeah. it might not relate at all to what civilians experience yeah and this is the thing with a veterans group there's there's lots of veterans groups and i you know there's their experiences are completely different and you, you know i've heard on your previous podcast and from when we've spoken before when you come back from operations 
it's that what everyone else is just cracking on as normal what's going on you go down to the pub and someone else's version of stress is completely different to someone coming back from a tour you know the they'll talk about things that hold on do you know what's going on out, out there so i'm i'm fully aware of the, the the difference but it's just trying to do something that that and this is why i'm looking for some it's a resource to tap yeah, in. Yeah. it's a resource to tap into yeah. right and it doesn't have to be restricted to uk either does it yeah. can can you know can be because if it works here it work for veterans anywhere and it doesn't even have to be veterans it's serving personnel i've spoken to uh, some people from the mod um and then we've got to make further contact but it's just that what can what can we do to try and help in your research so far not with veterans but with um with general general civ pop what is there a common th is there a common theme to to people's path to uh attempted suicide or suicide is there a common common like uh steps they go through things that happen we mentioned bereavements before yeah. you got divorce you got you know um redundancy other stuff is it like a, is it like a one that, that one sort of sets circumstances that stands out is that well, i've heard that one i've heard that that i can see i can see that suicide coming I, I, i've heard that yeah before. um well we, this is the thing because everyone will say you know it's, it's hindsight is a wonderful thing isn't it people will say oh, i knew that was happening well if you did <laughs> why didn't you do anything about it and um it's uh, most of our our deployments are um just you know i can't speak for other force areas but the most of ours are suicide interventions and it's just trying to work out because we can look at the statistics of what what was the lead up to it because after deployments we fill in a sort of a, a post deployment sheet which can, you can then tap into and see you know on pie pie charts and everything what's the the most common themes uh, and and the best ways of resolving them but there's an awful lot of domestic related issues you know what do you, what do you mean you know where relationship issues um you could but they could like bereavement as well within a uh a domestic incident unemployment isolation you know there's a big farming community in you know all over the uk there's a in rural areas there's charities there trying to help specifically you know members of the farming community because of isolation interesting you mentioned that very interesting you mentioned that have you heard of a guy called jeremy gibbs no so jeremy gibbs is he's not ex mil but he's he set up a, an organization called forces farming hmm. um and it and he's his background is agriculture yeah. and commercially but also on the ground you know getting dirty um and he was saying a couple of weeks but i did a little snapshot podcast with him um and he was saying about the suicide rate in, in, in farmers is huge it's a mm. massive suicide rate for what you're saying there um and he set up forces farming to try and bring to try and make it easier for veteran uh, ex-mill yeah. veterans to get into the ag agriculture because yeah. it's, it's a very very similar sort of community very hard working yeah. you know it it's uh it, it's got that the banter it's got you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, all all that all that sort of cliche military outdoor um builder yeah. farmer stuff yeah. you know um why did why did he pop into my head then when you oh when you mentioned the the suicides with, with farmers yeah sorry go on i interrupted there yeah but you know just saying that um suicides or the attempts there's a there's an awful lot of mental health issues as well you know we've got high risk vulnerable missing people um uh and for us, you know, people using mobile phones, a lot of uh, the younger younger kids will communicate with us on text or other social media, or, or we use a third party. So we'll use somebody that they know that will say, I'm with the police, you know, so if, if they've got Facebook or something, we can use use their friends as intermediaries. Obviously, we've got to make sure that their friends are assessed and listen to us and and follow follow the instructions really it's anything we can do to try and find someone so if, we, if we're not making any progress then we try another method of using a friend or family member to uh, to try and tap in and, and and get some ground have you seen an increase in uh teenage suicides over the last 10 years 10 15 years yeah well interest interestingly enough i was down in the british transport police headquarters in december for a um uh 
suicide prevention conference and and it was highlighted there about not only the rail suicide issues but the increase from one of the guest speakers there about their uh, teenage suicides the social media issues and online bullying and it's higher in girls right yeah 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 that's yeah. um you know when you see the statistics you think you it's, know it's it's shocking it's fucking crazy mm. people don't realize no. um I first heard of this on another podcast, the Joe Rogan podcast, <clears throat> and he was talking about it there, um, where the suicide, teenage suicide rates in, in America have gone through the roof, and particularly where girls are concerned. Yeah. Teenage girls have gone through the roof. When you look back over the data, and obviously correlation does not equal causation, yeah. but they look back over the, the data, it, it almost directly correlates with um, uh, the, the, the kind of out of social media and smartphones that that, that tech combined with the, with the the platforms twitter was 07 i think twitter was 07 i think facebook was shortly after and, and as time has gone on people and the use of it's gone up the suicide rate's gone to the roof and you think well why 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 girls yeah and i think i think i spoke about this before but what are boys doing when they want to piss each other off when they when they don't like you we're, we're, we're both yeah. kids. We're like, yeah, well, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to take 50 cuts. Yeah, yeah, fine, if we don't sort it, it out on a, on a football yeah. pitch or a rugby pitch somewhere, yeah. we'll do it that way and try and batter each other, right? Well, girls don't do that because they, they, different things make them tick and they'll try and harm the other person emotionally. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to do it these days with the social media because you can get your WhatsApp groups and exclude that girl. Yeah, yeah, but we'll yeah. have a WhatsApp group. We'll all be talking about it. We'll have this WhatsApp group. We'll have because it's Instagram. the same as isolation, isn't it? It's yeah. the, what's yeah. going on. Uh, and that's that just the element yeah. of it. And then you've got the isolation. Yeah. The, uh, the isolation, you've got the, the exclusion, the, everything. The lack yeah. of contact, the lack of that stuff that you and I grew yeah. up with. It's massive. It really worries me. I've got yeah. two, two young girls. Yeah. It really worries me. But um, I just no, I thought I'd ask the question. Interesting on the, the teenage side of things. Because, yeah, we, we've. Um, we obviously have to communicate with them as well, and some people would think, "Well, so you're texting or you're speaking to a 14 year old missing person?" You think I'm trying to help? <laughs> you know, it's you know we'll do anything we can to try and help. That's my whole goal is just stop people hurting themselves, stop people killing themselves. So if we can learn from what we do, you know, and if anyone's got suggestions, then we take them on board because the the world is changing so quickly. So like we said there with social media, I know that the majority of them now, if people put in suicide in the search, so if you go onto Twitter or Facebook and you write suicide, there should be a prompt, I you know, are you feeling okay? Do you want to talk to it? And it'll oh, open really? up things. Yeah, okay. this is um, something that's I I was only made aware of a few weeks ago. So that you know, it's it's trying to stop that, you know, so that so those organisations are taking some kind of responsibility for the outcomes around the world, you know, of the the like you say the online bullying, the suicidal thoughts and behaviours and obviously the, the completion of it. And and you know, and these these organisations are doing it because if you think of how big they are as companies, it's just you know, and unfortunately now uh I think with the current climate now with the covid 19 i think anxiety levels are probably going to increase as well well you say that right so <laughs> <laughs> we've moved you on say, <laughs> mate, you say that i'm going to go back to the book tribe hmm. right I, I, i've literally been reading for three days yeah okay not three days solid i started, <laughs> I I started three days ago page six <laughs> <laughs> yeah page six um so one of the interesting things in it, which is why this subject really interests me, the suicide, the mental illness, um, and especially coming on about we're talking about community and what pe- what makes what maybe, what makes people happy, what, what makes yeah. people sad, right? During the Second World War, so uh, during the Second World War um, in the UK, the government, Churchill and the government were in the build up to the to the Blitz. Um, they were super worried about the impact that that was going to have on the UK in terms of. Hmm. mentally and they estimated some crazy numbers of what they would they would lose people to suicide as soon as like this the, the war went full flow the bombing started happening they thought we're going to lose hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people i think they estimate three millions yeah. to suicide yeah. yeah and then all the psychiatric wars are going to fill up and then you're going to have like it's just going to be a fucking nightmare and in actual fact what happened when when stuff went pear-shaped 57 days it was non-stop the first yeah. in the first the start of the blitz 57 days non-stop then they got bombed and in that in that period what actually happened was uh, sorry over the the longer period of the, the whole thing what they actually found was in retrospect um 
suicide rate dropped uh depression dropped it went up in women yeah but the suicide rate of women came down yeah. dropped um you had uh, uh, people were drinking the same not more they weren't getting pissed more they were drinking the same yeah. or less uh and the psychiatric wards were less full people mm. weren't going to them people came together yeah because what does a crisis create it creates it, it means i was fucking books make me think about all sorts it, <laughs> it, it, it it brought me back to what you were talking about yeah. there what the veteran experience operations and stuff like that and we we look at that and we think or we look at a mental illness in a veteran you think right. why, why is that oh it must have been something they, they saw or they did or, or or that happened to them right and that can be the case absolutely but there's something else a different way i'm looking at it now mm. in that um when in the same time same kind of way as in the blitz in the same kind of way as you, you're trying to put yourself on the same level as the person you're trying to talk yeah. around okay you try there's, there's nothing isn't it, you know there's no other factors apart from you just two people talking having a chat um and you're trying to help and in the same way as operations it doesn't matter if, if you're, when you're on ops on a you know on a kinetic activity it doesn't matter if your platoon commander has got millions of pounds in the bank and you've got pennies or you've got a mate who's got yeah. a degree and you've got like two gcses it it doesn't make it you're all equal yeah. you're all equal and all the knowledge you've been taught it all makes it all is applicable in the same way you can do ex i can do exactly the same as what i can do for the guy next to me yeah, yeah? I'm all in 11 playing field and then when so you, that that sense of community a tribe all there huge yeah. really huge part when you come out of that and away from it hmm. and you come back into the real world and you come back to that disconnect your sense of purpose you haven't got the um you, you haven't got that value in you you feel less valued in society yeah. and that's when stuff goes pear shape leads to melting illness and that and yeah. i'm talking about veterans there yeah. but a lot of the time i'm sure it'd be the same with the average general population it's just a completely different journey for them to get to the yeah. same stage yeah. completely different experiences and it's experience the same thing kicked out by the family on the streets yeah. no money can't get a job down the gut it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse how many uh what's the percentage of homeless people have that you've experienced trying to kill themselves me i haven't actually i haven't, I haven't experienced any i wonder what that tells you hmm. you got me thinking now <laughs> Go on. No, no, no. no. Just, <laughs> but, you know, like you were saying there, I mean, when you left the forces, you know, I, I left and I I went straight into the bit. I had four days off. When did you get out? 2000. Oh, okay. April 2000, and then four days off, so I had a long weekend. I joined a month later. And, and joined Kent Police. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I went straight from, uh, I was down in Shorncliffe at the time, so, you know, the old Folkestone barracks. Yeah. So I went from, from there and then started at Ashford Police Training Centre four days later. So, you know, and I was in a detachment at the time, so it was we'd already moved away from that sort of company element. It was just um, a few of us down there, and I left straight into another organisation with uniforms. Like that. Ooh, not the same, and certainly not the same level of banter. <laughs> um, you know, they're completely different. But I went into that, it's, you know, and I dread to think what... So I joined in, you know, six, as age 16, and I, I, if the pension thing changes and goes back to what it was, I could leave in 2023. And I know the feeling you're going to get the day you leave an organisation after serving 30 years in uniform, you leave, is that, well, what do I do now? Could, uh, could you, do you reckon you could have gone into like a, just a nine to five desk job doing something for some company making money? No. <laughs> no. but that's what happens yeah. that, i mean i do sort of that now yeah. but i enjoy it but so when i left sort of similar to you when i left the day before i was officially out i was yeah. already in iraq yeah. and i was working on a, a big contract there lots of ex-military in fact everyone was ex-military yeah. and it was a it was a, a soft well there was no transition yeah. there was no transition out of the military into civvies yeah. civvies. that came four years later yeah. when i finished doing that work and then came back to the uk and then tried to go into normal normal Normal, normal, UK, normal. normal UK life, <laughs> normal, normal person life, you know, and that means being with normal people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and, 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 and in the pub, they look at what your, your uh, habits are and go, what yeah, are you doing? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean you're on the piss every night? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you're skint by day yeah. four of the month? <laughs> you're 30 years old. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's that, it's that thing, you sort of dread it. And you see people that leave now 
Now, if you think if you've been on shifts, so uh, I remember that there was a thing when, when we joined, you know, the it's a, quite a depressing thing. The, the life expectancy of a shift worker after 30 years was very, very low because your your body never catches up. On the old shift pattern that some forces used, it was just your constant jet lag and you'd finish, you know, and it. Um, I know it's different to, you know, there's obviously a lot of people who might be listening who've been through, you know, horrific shifts and shift patterns. But, you know, if you're 30 years, days, late, you know, mornings, late nights, mornings, late nights, that does take, it's going to take an effect on your body, isn't it? Your immune system, everything. And then when that stops, your body's like, what's going on? Well, I did a study a few years back. I say few, I think it's about seven or eight years ago. It was while I was in Iraq working, and there was a guy. <clears throat> so I was doing shift work at the time. I was um, managing uh, security on a site out there, and there was a there was one of the clients. He worked for Weatherford. He was a he was a Cypriot like Cypriot guy, and he would do six weeks on and six weeks off. I think you know, at home, six weeks okay. in country, six weeks at home. And uh, but when he would come out on his six weeks, he would elect to do the night shift. For six weeks, by day, by week two, the guy was like the walking dead. He was like the <laughs> walking dead. And one of the things, when this study came out, is after I knew him, and this study came out, and it was on, it was specifically about what is the impact of night shift on the human physiology, yeah. right? If, 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 if physiology is the right word, but anyway, on the fucking body and the mind. One of the things they found was if you do, um, if you do a, a prolonged night shifts. Your risk of getting diabetes, I can't remember which type it was, yeah. but your risk of di- getting diabetes goes up by something f- like f- um, tr- uh, 400%, like four times yeah. as much, by four times as much. You're more likely to, to develop heart disease. And because you're saying, hey, your body, even though we think you, I experienced that, that I would do two weeks on nights when I first got there, then six weeks on days, and then two weeks on nights, right? When I was on, and these are things that people don't realize. It's like the impact of sleep on you. Yeah. People don't realize unless you've actually experienced it. You can't really. It's hard to understand. I used to do two weeks on nights, right? And on those nights, I would I would sleep for twelve hours. Okay, no, it'd be like ten hours. I get up, I go to the gym. I'd I'd uh, so I'd sleep through the day to, for ten, yeah, yeah, ten, eleven hours. Yeah, through I sleep through the day. I get up then, I go to the gym before my breakfast, which is actually dinner, I'd be able to yeah. full, you know, then have a three meals through the night, then get back to bed. I was knackered, non-stop knackered all the time, even though I was getting like 10, 11 yeah. hours kip. When I was on days, I'd do six, seven hours sleep, I'd be up, bang, I'd be going to the gym twice, I'd be having my three meals for six weeks, then back onto nights, I'd be fucked. Yeah. I could get more sleep, in fact. Because yeah. you, you, your body, what's the system, the, 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 the body system, the day and night system where it processes this? The food and that it's got some fucking funky name. But basically, <laughs> yeah, I you could say, be on. I know, but I'm not yeah, going to tell you. You could be on nights for six months. Yeah. Your body will not adapt to it. Your in, your digestive system will not adapt yeah. to it. There are things that switch on in your body during the day and they switch off at night. Mm. One of the things that switches off at night, at night most of the stuff, is your, is your digestive system. That's why when you eat last thing at night, you wake up, you still feel full. You, you've got a crap yeah. night's sleep because your your body slows down processing it. Yeah. Mate, what are we we're going to all the <laughs> <laughs> What have we come to talk about? <laughs> What's this coffee you gave us, Baz? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, how have we gone to that? <laughs> transition, I think it was. Something. Transition. Yeah, from, from, uh, transition. From the, from, the, from, the, well, yeah, from the forces into normal life. But, it's, but it's, it is just weird. And, it, you know, you see people. I cannot imagine, you know, factory workers go through the same thing. Shifts. It's just a... Oh, Hideous. Horrific. Hideous. The thing is, how do you get a... You're going to get out and you're going to do a job. Yeah. You, you, there are very few. Well, there are very few people. If anyone can pick the ideal job, they want to go and go and go and yeah. do it. I mean, you have to for that kind of to keep that value and sort of yeah. purpose in your life. You have to do extracurricular stuff. I yeah. mean, I've, you've already mentioned Team Republic UK in the yeah, past yeah. before. I mean, that that's Great one shirts. example. I've just had an email this morning, uh, yeah. this afternoon from from them. Yeah. Um, in fact, I can't say what the email was. But they're looking. I don't know. I can't know. But they're looking for people. They they want need volunteers. Yeah. Need them now yeah. to deal with something in the like pretty fucking pretty pretty rapidly, and uh, and even though I hardly do, I put any hardly put any hours into the team. I'm a volunteer there. Yeah. When I, you know, and majority of the ex-military, but it's that I'm on the roster. I'm on the all bat. Yeah. It's like, and then you get the email. You go. I'm valued because they're asking me to go. Yeah. They ask everyone, mind, but they're asking <laughs> me to go, right? You know. Would you be like if we want you to go? Could you go? 
man, it gives you so much. It gives it gives you so much value in you. It gives you so much uh, so much motivation. Whereas you know the the jobs are, your job is a functional thing. You yeah, can yeah. need to have the money and bring it in. And if it if it's good for you and you enjoy it, that's amazing. But how many people have that? Yeah, no one. But like you're saying there, with, with feeling valued and feeling listened to, and you know, you think of that person that we were talking about earlier. That's what you've got to make people think. If they've been sort of pushed out by their family, whatever, all through the time, and you make someone feel valued and you listen to them, if you can imagine you put a sign on someone's head like, make me feel important, make me listen, you know, listen to me, that's what most people want. Everyone likes a pat on the back. Everyone likes, as much as they won't admit it, but you like people listening to you. And that's what our job is. We listen to people, make them feel valued, and it's genuine. You know, I, I love chatting to people. That's why I got into it, you know, and it's there's other other reasons as well, which we sort of spoke to spoke about earlier, you know, of an incident I was involved in that's made me more aware through what I've been through of Do you want to talk about it? Uh well I was involved I was involved in a, a head on fatal collision, which was my fault. So, you know, I've suffered injuries but somebody died as a result of my actions. So I've you, you live with that guilt. And I've, you know, I've, I've been uh, dealt with for that, but it's the long term things, you know, and there's that, what can I do to give something back? And that's all I try and do. You know, it's that what drives you, we talked about P PTSD, we go to Flint House, it's a police rehab centre. And down there we had, you know, the counselling, and I didn't even know it was a counselling session, it was just a chat with someone that just suddenly turned into, you tick, tick, you've got this. And as soon as they labelled it and put it, you know, put, they said PTSD. You know, All right, never heard of that. Gave me a book, read about it, and then it was that trying again. It was using sort of the recovery from the injuries, trying to get back, and then constantly trying to prove yourself that you know it wasn't. It was an accident. You've trying to do some good to make up for it. <clears throat> so that you know, when you go to see people who've been through something. Uh, there's that sort of you you get an understanding you know if someone's been through something like that and you can say well it's that commonality i suppose you give a little get a lot so if i give a little bit of information about myself you generally get a lot back you know so if there's that you try and get that bond you can start getting that rapport getting the trust and then start in influencing behavior and then making the behavioral change you know it's the behavioral change staircase they call it so, you know, you, you just take your time and you move up these steps of communication to where you're at a point of influence in people. And then, as like I said, the conversation with a purpose. You go in there, non-judgmental, listen, let people vent, get get an understanding. And what we do is try and get hooks into people. So if you think of a person, this is the easiest way of doing it, think of a person and you've got a normal fishing line and hook and you want to get them back, and they talk about family values and things, and you just get a little hook in them. You're not going to get them back on that one little hook. You need quite a lot. They're talking about their values, their beliefs, uh, what makes them tick. And when you start listening and you and you give this back and you say, well, you talked about this person who's important to you. How would they feel now? You, you told me about that incident. You've clearly got values. You're a breadwinner. You have you value your family. You've told me about your daughter's and you get these little hooks in, and it's easier to bring someone back from the bridge the more hooks you've got into them. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to, with these conversations, the, the you know you go there, you you are non-judgmental, but your aim and objective is obviously to. They don't want you don't want them to jump. You don't want them to hurt themselves or anybody else. How can you do it? And you just listen. So using the active listening skills that we teach, is try and get people through, and it's just. Um, getting these hooks into people and repeating some things they say, minimal encouragers, which is a good one, which you've done quite a lot during this. And I, when you take it your turn, it could just be a nod or a mm-hmm, you know, so, <laughs> but that's that's your turn in a conversation, you know. Oh, yeah. So if I said, uh, and then this Thanks happened, and you went, uh -huh. no, no, but every, everyone does it. When you start looking at it, I do it, everybody does it. Yeah. It's your turn, my turn. Open questions. You know, so you're encouraging people to give a bit of information rather than yes, no answers. Like, um, you know, the reflection on the words, empathy. What happens when... 
what happens after what happens after you, you successfully negotiate with someone what happens to that person uh well it depends really let's so, say it's an adult let's say it's an adult uh, it depends what the incident is so sometimes if it's if it's crime related then obviously we you know we won't we don't lie to people we'll do, you know we don't lie and say oh nothing's going to happen as a result of you doing this you have to sometimes give them a reality check and say you know <clears throat> you've barricaded the door you've done this that and the other you've shown a weapon to officers and you've threatened to hurt this person and they're in there and they can't get out you're going to be coming down the police station you know you've got you've got to show them that that's going to happen because if you say nothing's going to happen at all and then when when they do come out and there's all these things it's just going to kick off again and you've lost all of that trust so you've got to uh, deal with it correctly you know you've got to just work out the right time when you're going to say what's going to happen and yeah most people realize that that's illegal and they're going to be questions asked of them and they're going to have to go down the neck but say if it's not that and they don't get arrested sometimes mental health will have mental health workers with us or they'll we'll take them to hospital if they're injured we'll take them to or we'll, we'll hand them over to paramedics or mental health teams <coughs> you know we don't just they're out see ya it's the, the ongoing care package of the most appropriate agency really without giving away compromising details what's mm. the strangest incident you've dealt with from that point of view in fact never mind the negotiation so negotiation included but obviously your normal day-to-day -day officer work what is the strangest incident you've dealt with being a bobby on the beat strangest oh i think uh i don't know there's, there's so many they're just weird but to us, outside of the locker room <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, i don't know what to say now That's, um I don't know because I was I joined like Kent Police and I was straight into Dover Police Station and Folkestone, so that's completely different policing to where we are now. I've never worked in a city, but you know we we see things and you know it's just an awful. I never realised how many people passed away before I joined. How many people know. died? Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, but you know when you just you're you're I was you're not naive. I was in a sort of you're in your little area and you, just, you don't really know what's going on in the real world. And then I couldn't believe how many calls you get. Of, oh, and then it's, oh, and you, you go into things thinking, what? And then some of the incidents you go to and some of the offences, you think, what? You know, it's just completely surreal. Like what? Um, uh, well, it's just the, the things that people think are normal as well. When you go to someone's house and they're, they're covered in glue and nothing else. And they're eating frozen, like battered fish as a lollipop that was my first week in the police what <laughs> it's all, huh? was that was that dover yeah, yeah. one paris barracks is it, is it one paris lot <laughs> no, that just makes like, sense <laughs> what's going on here i'm not thinking uh, glue what kind of glue i copied remember the old copy decks you know the, oh, like, the, the white, white stuff the stank. Think, with, yeah like made of horse bones on it or whatever it was just smoked fish was it a man or a woman no this was a uh, like quite a young kid just covered in glue and i thought What's going on here? What and were you then, called for? Yeah, it was a, yeah. <laughs> it was, a it was an even weirder. It was a job. sticky situation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, and it was just they called for their their sort of their, their other you know the the other child to come out who was exactly the same. And then you know the parents came out who were, didn't seem to think it was anything unusual. And then it just got stranger from then. You know that there was more. Yeah, the dogs. <laughs> I think the dog went inside to go to the toilet, not outside. <laughs> it was just, but from there, it just you know, the amount of jobs that you go to week in, week out, are they seem to get there's some strange, strange things. Um, I don't know. It's just it's it's just weird to be. It's, there's that many. I can't really think of them. It's yeah, a bit yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but we've been to you know you be, you go to some horrific jobs as well, and you know, and it's it's just. Odd, but I, you know, I've been to some horrific crashes, and you think, uh oh, and your first day, and you think it's going to be real bad, and then someone just gets out with no injuries and go, oh, that was lucky, you know, what? And other, in, you know, and they just walk off. You think, what? How how does that happen? And everyone's in, you know, everyone's in a bit of a daze. But they're the ones that they're the thing, they're the kind of situation that stick in my mind that uh, make me have the most admiration for emergency services, police, ambulance, and. Um... Not Royal Military Police, oh. probably. Uh, <laughs> police, ambulance, and uh, fire service. Fire, yeah, you forgot um, that. Because 
<laughs> because uh you know when you're not um sometimes you experience some bad stuff right um as you as you know but for the emergency services they it's like it's not an if you're going to experience it it's when it's yeah. constant constant and the car crashes is one that i would hate to have to deal with it because yeah. some of those some of those situations must be grim absolutely grim you know um and and then and on a on a, on a paramedic side of life gonna you know constantly trying to save people when they're on on death door and, and how many you know how many how many deaths can you cope with before it's it's a, yeah. it must be it's a similar kind of thing with the negotiation how many people can you deal with you know um and other mental resilience to deal with because you can't save everyone right other mental resilience to deal with until you go i need to switch this off i need to, i need to, i need to move away from this i'm not saying that yeah, that's yeah, you yeah. my mate's a, a paramedic in london and when he when he uh when he went down and joined the he's ex-military and he went down and joined uh the london army service he he was enjoying it yeah. oh he is enjoying it i should say he is enjoying <laughs> it and but he was saying that before he went there he's saying that apparently like the the, 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 not career expectancy. The, the expectancy of of the duration that you that people usually last, maximum average maximum, last in work in, in London ambulance service as a paramedic is four years before burnout, completely burnt out because of the, because of the way the job is so such high pressure. Not just dealing with the stuff on the ground, but dealing with the 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 paperwork the court cases and the, and that fear after the two sides yeah, of things yeah. same with any job these yeah, days yeah. well that not same with any job but same with any emergency services these days and he was saying four years and he you know he has been enjoying it going along the way but as it's gone on he's sort of he's he, he was resilient at the start not resilient he's like i can four years but actually you know i can smash yeah, yeah. this out and now he's like oh, i can see what i can see now why it only lasts four years he just gets you down some of the stories he tells me you know it's like hideous hideous um yeah, because the things they deal with as well, and there's that expectation, you know, like, we'll be there, say if you're first at the scene, and officers are dealing with someone, and then a paramedic turns up, you're like, whew. You know, you just look at the green uniform and go, you saved them. Well, there's situations where you, all three of you lay yeah. on each other for all sorts of yeah. things. He was talking about a situation where there was a, 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 a suicidal um, person on the underground, and he had, he had to sit there with her. Um, there was no police. He had to sit there with her. It was like it was something ridiculous, like a half hour, forty five minutes. Yeah. I, I say her. I can't remember if it's a woman or a man. And every every few, he'd be chatting to her and trying to keep her just like I keep saying her. I don't even know it's a man or a woman. He was chatting to this person um, and trying to keep them calm. But every few minutes they fly off the handle and try and throw themselves onto yeah. the track. And and that for half hour, forty five minutes, just like man. It's, you all have to do a bit of each other's jobs. Yeah. I, it's I, it's hard work, man. It's hard work. It must be hideous. I mean, there's there's obviously tough times, but you know, everyone said to me now that I'm, you know, I fly in a desk. I get out as often as I can. <laughs> when you know, because I I love I love policing. It's it's I have a, a whale of a time. I try and keep morale up. You know, you buy buying people cakes. You get you deal with this. You get a cake. Cops work on cakes and sweets, and you you know, it's just trying to keep people focused on something other than the mountains of paperwork and the constant calls it's just you know trying to keep people going and i'm you know I, a lot of my stuff is now obviously inspecting and trying to trying to look at where we can make improvements and things like that. but i like getting out you know i joined the job to to go and have go out and do do as much as i can so are you talking about there like inspecting that's you're not talking about the negotiation side and that research side you're talking about something else yeah, yeah my, my job is you know as a as an in, a police inspector our job is to inspect scrutinize and, and improve performance so we've got a lot of things to do and we've got to have that sort of middle manager uh overview of what's going on how can we make improvements where are we where are we dip in what can we do to try and fix that and it's just trying to trying to keep people up because obviously the staffing's down in all well all jobs i imagine now it's just, how bad um I know it's just the because the public want an awful lot and we can't do everything, you know, and it's trying to we've got a lot of priorities, you know, and we, we're lucky where we work, the community generally on our on our side, you know, and there are, I know there are areas where there's like no go areas for police and there's a lot of bad feeling. But we, we you, you know, you, yourself, 
Wales, it's really, you know, it's, it's friendly. There's also bad incidents you go to and there's, there's people that don't like you. But we generally got the support of the public. And that's the thing when I when I moved up there in 2003, it was people waving at police cars, which I was thinking, what? what? <laughs> Stopping the car, what are you doing? They said, oh, we just waved at the car. Oh, okay. And it was just <laughs> because it's it's that community, you know, there's a lot of that, which was something I noticed coming from somewhere that was busy. Um, you know, in Kent, there's obviously a lot of through, you know, the, the gateway to Europe, wasn't it? A lot of constant traffic, lots of flow of people. And, you know, you, it was just running around a lot but when i got up to wales it was just it's a different completely different style of policing but it's really really nice and the thing is you know you can make a positive impact on where, on where you work as well where you live and where you work so if you target certain things you've got a selfish reason for doing it, you know so if your kids go to a school in a certain area and you police that area you say well i i'm targeting drug offenders in this area because I don't want my kids getting off of drugs. So, you, you know, it's, there's that sort of personal thing where I imagine in a lot of countries around around the world, you know, if you just if you police in a city and you live a long way out, there may be some people that just turn up, do it, go. Whereas we live, um, you know, I, I live where I where I work. So I've got to make sure it do a good job because it reflects on, you know, and I think that's what most people do. They say, you know, it's, it's nice. I, I love working where I work. And I've just moved over, obviously, over to the, towards the sea for work, and it's just a completely different vibe. It's brilliant. I've got two things floating through my head at the minute. And that's the old series heartbeat, and uh, and uh, also, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. It's not, it's and not like uh, that. hot fuzz. <laughs> when, when Sean Payne comes from the city to the, <laughs> yeah. is it Gloucester somewhere? Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> Sar- Sergeant Angle. Yeah, yeah, but it's you know it's 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 brilliant. I absolutely love my job. Uh, you know, and I. I one of the lucky ones. I love it, and being the opportunity to do these specialist things is is fantastic. And the feeling of satisfaction you get, and then like this this project here, if it if it goes on, and what we get some people to to help, then it'd be you know it'd be a really good thing to do. Uh, so let's come back up the project then. Yeah. <clears throat> so explain from from the start. Explain explain the project because we've talked about the research of the veterans side of things, yeah. or is that the project? Yeah, because what we are trying to do is is get the veterans to participate and say, you know, obviously that we've got the ethical documents of why we're doing it, and so that academics can be involved. So that's all about the aftercare. But it's just doing the series of questions for people to try and find the lead up to it, which we can feed into the relevant agencies, but the cause of that crisis and what made them stop, uh, you know, stop jumping as the examples we've used throughout this. So if I can find out exactly what that is, then I'm, the aim is to feed that into training for all police officers, um, you know, in, in our force as to, if you come to this incident, try this. So that's part of the training package. And instead of it being a filtered and sanitised version, it will be from the people themselves that say, do you know what? It wasn't the police. Somebody, so a, a motorist just stopped, got out of their car, sat next to me and put their hand on my leg and just said what's up can i help it's that so if it, it's that personal contact so but if it's the language used the way the approach was made the you know however and anything that anyone can say this is what made me stop then we're going to try and roll that into some training for officers so that they're confident and then i would imagine from speaking there's there's quite a few public uh or charities and organizations where i work that are interested in having that input just for local residents because if you see you know we, we've all got this culture you see you see somebody stranded at the side of the road do you ever stop well yeah. it depends on the situation but you know and most people just go oh look if you see someone on the edge of a bridge and you're on a busy busy road do you stop most people don't it's like well that's that's bad and carry on going to work, whereas that is that one you person. Think, yeah, I don't know, mate. If they're gonna, if they're to the edge of the bridge, they're blatantly gonna jump off. Yeah, but there, there are. You'll, you'll see on YouTube. There's some. There's a lot of people that just <sighs> crack on, and well, you think, what? Idi- How would you do yeah. that? Yeah, <laughs> mental. But, but this is the thing, you know. It's that that. Well, that was weird, and they carry. Some people can do that, but 
I don't think I could. I've never, you know, I've never seen it when I've not been at work. I've never seen it. And you'd like to think I would stop. I would do this. But, you know, some people are just focused on other things and go, somebody else will deal with that. Somebody else will deal mm-hmm. with that. Like, I think it's Malcolm Gladwell. Is it that thing you were talking about with Tribe, you know, about the Blitz spirit and that? You mentioned that in one of his books. But also, you know, when you task someone, instead of saying, can I have a volunteer? You know, if there's a, an incident you go, I need someone to help. Everyone assumes that somebody else is going to help and they all keep walking. But if you say, man in the red coat, I need you to come over and do this. They'll, oh, I've got a red coat on. I've been told what to do and they'll do it. So it's that, you know, who's going to stop? And some people don't, but I'd like to think most people would. And that's what we're trying to do is if if we can get this training and the awareness out for, to give people confidence to step up. And it's that it's just that thing. I don't know if you've seen the British Transport Police and the Samaritans did a thing about small talk saves lives, where I can give you uh, some of the information on it anyway. But it's just really simple advert with a with a woman who's just she's just it's it goes through parts of her life and she says the same thing to everyone when she's in an ice cream queue, you know, on a beach. She's watching the kids play football. She says the same thing to the person. You know, what about this weather? What about this weather? And then she's on the platform and she sees someone by the edge and she just walks up and says what about this weather and they look at her and then she just says are you all right and then you see the after you know where people are coming in to help and it's just that thing it's that don't be a don't be distant if you think most things there's a, there's a guy called kevin hines uh he's one of the 19 survivors from the golden gate bridge so over 2,000 people have jumped off the golden gate bridge and died but 19 have survived and he's one of them they they jumped in but didn't jump themselves yeah, so 19 have, so 2,000 odd have jumped, but 19 of those have survived, and he's one of them, and he now does uh, charity work in the in the US. And there's a real powerful video of him on, on YouTube when he talks about his instant regret, because he got a four-second free fall. As soon as he went over, it's just regret. Oh, my God. And then it's the, you know, oof, you know it's a five- or six-minute video, and I think it's just called I Survived the Golden Gate Bridge. And show, it's that just... to pe- show that to people on the bridge. Yeah, but we show it to <laughs> Bring people. An iPad. We show it to everyone on the, um, you know, on this training that we're, we've rolled out about, you know, because he talks about the people that walked past him. He's there crying, holding onto the railings. No. And everyone just walks past him. That's America, though. And then somebody says, can you take my picture? You know. Oh, my God. And then I think, he, you know, he goes from there. And he now is a motivational speaker, but you know, it, there's there's so much to this, and I don't I don't want to be you know, I'm no expert at all. My learning is through self interest in the topic. You know, I'm not an academic. It's just experiential learning through training and constantly reading and trying to up my own skill set to to try and deal with it. And then speaking rather than just disengage completely, it's actually speaking to the people that we've helped and say. What was it that, that led up to this? What do you think could have helped in that run-up to this? And what was it that we said or did that made you then come back? So if we can roll that out to anybody, it can only be a good thing, I think. No, I, yeah, I think it's really important. I, th- I think it's really interesting, interesting information. The project's important. One of the th- and the reason I think that is one of the things that I uh, that I think makes me more mentally resilient now than I was at sort of my hardest time, my... my uh, yeah, my hardest time, well, the hardest time for me um, is I'm just, I, I have more knowledge in my head about mental health. Yeah. I have I have more knowledge in my head about what can impact people, what makes people tick. Um, and it's just through conversations like this. Yeah. And it's through a bit of reading and just, you know, um, nothing crazy. But but because of, but because I have, I, I know a bit more now than I did before, I I I'm I can see things earlier myself, yeah. so um, I don't make it see you know a, a nightmare coming. But if I if I you know if I feel I now I now see now myself if I feel a bit under the weather I'm I mean I'm, I feel just a bit down one day yeah. fucking down so I don't mean that because you have to think oh, I feel down if I'm feeling like a little bit anxious a little bit pre- stressed you know I know I know I'm more noticeable of it as an earlier stage you go what's causing that and it's always gonna be something small yeah. and I, I got to deal with that I deal with yeah. that now in the same way it's made me much more aware of other people yeah. and 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 I was quite um, uh, empathic empathic 
Empath- empath- empathy. I thought you were going to say pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, was, I had quite a lot of empathy before. Yeah. So em- empathetic. Emp- yeah. empath- empa- it doesn't sound right, does it? Empathic. Empathetic. You had more empathy. I had more empathy before. <laughs> Um, I, I had a lot before anyway, but now I'm, <clears throat> I, I'm, I think I've got it even more. I'm just more conscious of the people. I mean, an example, there's a guy, there's a guy at work and, um, who in the past I would have not paid any, I would have just, obs- it would have been an observation of mine and I would have thought any deeper into it. Hmm. And, uh, and the always, ha- not my current work, previous work. And he always had, and he always had, um, Bags under his eyes when he came in. He always looked knackered. He never looked happy. Yeah. He never looked happy. He, he, he just, he was, oh man, he just, and I, since I, since I've learned more, I now look back and think, well, I didn't think anything at the time. Now it's, I, I then I come to find out that I actually thought drug, I, I yeah. thought drug habit at the time. I thought, he, he, and this is in, in London as well, I thought, He's got a drug habit. He's up all night, whatever. He's flipping, could be heroin or whatever. And then subsequently, I found out that um, he's got a he's got a personal matter at home he has yeah. to deal with. And it's a, it's and when I found out with the matter, I thought flipping it. I had the utmost respect for the guy because he was grafting, yeah. absolutely grafting. He was knackered every day in work because of the graft he had to put in at home, and uh, maybe looking at a completely different light. And so, you know, you it may be it makes me know. They delve a little deeper into why someone looks or acts the way they do, yeah. and that's really important when it comes to my friends and family, and especially the military community, because you, I now deal with people in a different way earlier on. If I yeah. think ah, something's not quite right here, instead of going and ringing someone else up and going something's not quite right with uh, Joe Bloggs, I'll do that as well. But I'll also I'll try and do something in the contact with them to. Yeah, yeah. To, just, just, just to try and understand it better, not try and fix it, not try and go. Oh, I'm the savior, but try and understand it better to try and see what the solution is, if there is one. And then, if it's a serious issue, flag it up. Because I think before, especially in the military, it's all a bit of a, you know, it was a label that nobody wanted, wasn't it? If you had any issues, you're like, oh, if I say anything, everyone's going to rip. <laughs> I'm going to get ripped for this, or, and then I think we've all done it. You know, you say things and you that pack mentality as well i think you know i remember early on uh seeing someone and they were you know looking back they were clearly suffering but they were the subject of like jokes from a section it was but, like not bullying it was proper you know this person was suffering massively <laughs> and we no one saw it because we didn't have the awareness back then the thing with this is this is the this is the challenge with the military and especially with the army and especially the infantry like it is you <clears throat> As a as an organisation, who whose you know role is to impose their will upon the enemy, okay, mm. in the hardest times, uh, you know, war conflict, right? You've got to maintain a a you've got to maintain that mentality that we can do everything we need to do. Uh, we shouldn't expose any weakness. I'm talking the bigger picture, as yeah. in the our, our forces to the enemy. But also internally, because within the units, because to expose a, to expose a weakness or show a weakness that you have or may or may not have, but it's seemingly have it, it can have an impact on your comrades, your commanders, your subordinates. In that they may they have mes- may have less confidence in your ability, and therefore less confidence in what the overall team does, and therefore it can affect the machine as a whole. Right. Yeah. So when you need to have that mentality, how do you then balance that? And you need to have the banter. You've got to have it. The problem is balancing that with it's actually okay to go and address an issue. You've got it. First off, identify it in yourself. Yeah. They're going to address it. I, and how he, the striking that balance is going to be hard because you go too far to the. It's okay. You to, lose the edge. It, yeah, 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 you yeah. Complete, it's okay to talk, da, 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 and it is. But if you go too hard towards the, uh, s- the I'm going to invert it commas the snowflake side yeah, of yeah. things. Go fully that way. Well, you haven't got an army anymore. Yeah. You, you've got it's it's nothing compared to what it, what it needs to be, especially as a small fighting force like yeah, we yeah. are. The balance is somewhere in between. Maintain everything that we're doing now. Yeah. Everything that we're doing now, the way it is, the banter, the camaraderie, all of it. But which I think has been happening over the last few years. It was certainly happening when I was as I was leaving. 
if someone turns round or it becomes apparent that someone has got an issue and they've gone off to go help, then they, they're not dealt with at the point of going getting up. They're not yeah. dealt with. That, that banner should stop, basically. Yeah. That banner should stop. That should stop. And it's, uh, okay, cool. You should crack on as normal. Such and such is off. He's got right sound. He'll be back. I saw it with a sergeant major. Yeah. A sergeant major um, had issues. And, uh, I, I don't know the full story. I, I know him. Um, he had issues. He went and got mental health treatment. I yeah. don't know what it was. Yeah. Uh, it would have been a course somewhere. And then he came back and finished his career. Like, finished his career. Had a good career. Fin- yeah. He might even still be in, you know. He might even still be in. I'm not sure. Yeah. And And that was a... That was a really good indication to me that it was going the right way, mental health wise. But we have got to be careful not to flipping. You, you, you can't, you can't stop all that camaraderie and banter. And all no. that. You can't do it. It's a necessity. You got well, to. I have think, it. think as well with the, with the things that the military deal with and the emergency services. There's got to be a bit of that to take the edge off it. That dark humour. There's got to be that because if you lose it, you know. It, I, I was. I remember being told, and I, I've always sort of listened to that. You know, and use it now. If you're not laughing about it, you're going to be crying about it. And if you bottle it up, there's a lot of people that still bottle things up because of this, the fear of, you know, being marked as having a, a weakness. And you think, do you know what? If you just talk about it, everyone's got issues. Everyone. And you just talk about it, get rid of it, move on. And it's easy to say, but I think there's that, like you said, in, in the military now, especially with the, with the infantry, it's quite hard. I've worked with quite a few infantry units, and you you see it. And there's you know there's rivalries in in between, isn't there? You know inside the regiments. But I th- like from what you were saying there, hopefully they're making the right changes. But you, you've got to be quite careful because we need to be an aggressive fighting force, and you can't be too far one way or the other, can you? You just got to strike that balance, which is the challenge. How do the police do it then? Um, well, it's. Well, it's completely different. I don't, don't think you can really compare the police and the military. No, but they, there's a balance needs to strike in with the police yeah, yeah. as well, right? Um, certain team, you see it in certain teams, but you know, I've been in twenty years now, and you see that you, I've seen the change in how things are done. And people are just more aware because you know, I imagine. Can you remember that um, life on Mars? Remember that? <laughs> that was clearly how the police were, and you look at that to where they are now. People are really aware of their audience, what's going on. And there's always going to be people that slip up. But most things are done through just it's knowing your audience. It's having that little bit of um, uh, awareness of what you say. You know, it's that inner voice first before it comes out. It's that think about what you say because of the, the effects it could have on people. And even comments, you know, comments or phrases... I think everyone, you, you must have changed yourself as well. You just said things 10 years ago that you wouldn't dream of saying now in a pub. I've done it, mate. <laughs> I've done it a couple of times and it has been disastrous. Yeah, yeah. And oh, you think, so it's that, disastrous. In, that inside voice just thinking, stop, 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 stop. Barrack, barrack you know. humour in a pub full of civvies. Yeah, doesn't no, work, does it? Especially when it involves race. Yeah. It does not go and down you well. Think, you know, so <laughs> I, I've seen a massive change in it. But you think, oh, I remember. And you can't even now tell stories to your colleagues of what I remember from when I first joined or when I was in the military I just I wouldn't even dream of saying some of the things mm. and you think mm. and this is the importance of that the, this is important about the veteran community and, the, and that, that um, it's that release fact, isn't it you in need fact, to any community in, 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 in like the emergency services side of things yeah. I had Helen Barnett on yeah um, and, and they, they I think are, we spoke about there and yeah and she's involved with like Hidden Valley Bushcraft and she went down there uh, I think she, she went down there it's a similar thing to what Wood, Woody's Lodge sounds yeah, like, yeah. right? Went down to Hidden Valley Bushcraft and, and her experience of that was amazing. She, she was down there with people she didn't know, mm. right? And she, down there there was, there was I don't know if there's any other police there, but there was ex-military there on, on the course, right? Just there, outside, chilling out, craft work, fire, you know, making your own food, cooking it in the ground and stuff like that yeah. with, with Nick. And um, the value she got from that was huge. The value she got from that was huge because even though she didn't know them, they're from a similar background: yeah. emergency services, security services, armed forces. Yeah. So she she knew exactly where she stood, and what yeah the gloves are off in terms of conversation. Yeah, you yeah, can yeah. say what you want. You know it. Yeah. I, like I I could I know I could go and be around a bunch of paramedics, a bunch of firemen, a bunch of police, and you know flipping I don't know 
in a bar somewhere. Yeah. And I know, ah, oh, I can take this conversation to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't get sacked. <laughs> yeah. But, it, you know, I remember listening, I listened to her podcast and you're thinking, God, she's been through some, through some stuff. It was amazing. She didn't live far away. Didn't live far away. I'm thinking, but you're right. You know, I think that we've all changed in there. There's that little bit of thought before, you know, think before you say yeah. it. But you've got to unwind. And some of the things that you see and you do, you've got to, you know, and people will frown at the fact that there was, that, you know, people have let off steam through laughing about certain things. It may seem completely inappropriate to someone looking in, but you don't, you know, it's done afterwards and it's done in a, in a place, you know, you would hope that be a safe, a safe place. But you've got to vent. You've got to get rid of it. Otherwise, you're just going to bottle it up. You're not going to sleep at night. You're going to have nightmares. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's part of life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's... Mm -hmm. um, but you know there have been some horrific ones, <laughs> which I won't go to in there. Mm -hmm. after. <laughs> we need to start wrapping it up. Yeah. Um, right, Ash. If people might be listening to this and go, I wouldn't mind helping them out with his research. Yeah, where are they going to go to? Uh, I'm on Twitter at insp. I think it's at insp Ash Bryce. Right, I'll put the so I'll put the link in the content in the blurb for this podcast yeah yeah okay. or they can you know if they follow me on there they can dm me and i'll i'll start making contact with them uh i'll put my you know my email address if, if you want it and you can distribute it if you want if anybody wants to be in contact because what we're trying to do is just do anything to help and get a bit more endorsement for it to get people to come forward to help because i think it might actually help other veterans if some a veteran's been through it what they tell us could help an awful lot more veterans and anybody else in the future it's not veteran specific but if there was something that you think well that really helped then that's what we're trying to find out and it is the simplest of questions with you know and obviously there's going to be a long lead up to it but we can try and analyze what people have said and what the the things where you know these academics are really keen to help and then if it works for that it will work for other communities if it works in the uk it'll work anywhere I would imagine. I agree. I so agree. that's what we're trying to do is make, basically make us a bit more professional and try and find out the reasons for for things so that we can stop it. I agree. Simple, simple project, but with complex issues. And I so, wouldn't want to sort of make any, you know, belittle anybody through that experience. So your Twitter account is at INSP Bryce. Ash Bryce, yeah. At INSP Ash Bryce. INSP, yeah. as in yeah, inspector. As inspector. INSP yeah. Ash Bryce. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, hang on. No. Oh. I want to hear your Friday night DJ no, voice. No, Come for, on. That's for afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Friday. It's Tuesday. I'm doing my Tuesday daytime voice. Hey, nice one. <laughs>